Hey, everybody. I have great news. We have a special surprise guest for Leading the Way 2021, and it is a person that uh, we have come to admire. We have come to uh, uh, so appreciate all that she does, whether it's here in the United States or in Mexico, and that is the one and only Patty Yinich. Patty, as many of you know, is a chef. I have had the honor of cooking nopales with her way back, you know, a couple of years ago in her kitchen. She's an author. I own a couple of her cookbooks, and I highly recommend the triple lime pound cake. It is amazing. And then third, she is the host of the new show on PBS, La Frontera. So before we get to the conversation with Patty, let's take a look at the trailer of La Frontera, and then we'll, we'll chat with the host. The idea of the border has profound meaning to me. As a Mexican-American, I always feel like I'm treading between two worlds. That's Texas. That's Mexico. I was born and raised in Mexico, then moved to the U.S. where I raised my family. And I've spent my career traveling my homeland, sharing Mexican food and culture with the world. Are you with me? I want to tell you things. Now. I'm setting my sights directly on the place where my two beloved countries meet. Little did they know that they came in to get the burrito and I'm gonna be making it for them, but what they don't know is I'm learning how to make them. <laughs> I'm gonna taste. It's phenomenal and it's so packed with so much flavor. Welcome to South Texas. We're just starting. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> take me there, take me there. Come on. Some people say Tex-Mex as though it's not a good thing. To us, it's everything. It's, it's a culture in and of itself. The food, the community, this is where Texas and Mexico come together for generations, if not centuries. In this two-part special, I'm traveling the Texas-Mexico border from far west Texas to the Gulf of Mexico, breaking myths and misconceptions about the communities that live and thrive here. ¿Por qué querías abrir en Estados Unidos? Porque siempre he buscado el sueño americano y que tuviera éxito en Estados Unidos. Abrimos el primero y fue un éxito tremendo desde el primer día. And yet, the story at the border has always been a complicated one. This country is always a bit fickle. Mm -hmm. You know, at times it loves you and it welcomes you and it wants to bring you in. And other times it's going to criminalize you. Does it annoy you that the border gets such bad press? It comes to a point where you say, hey, this is where I am from. I think that this sense of being from one region, that it's unique, and that's starting to see the benefits, not of what city has or the other, but what we have together. together. But for all the complexities of La Frontera, these communities feel alive and connected in a way that I have not experienced in all my years of travel. We have so much culture, so much history. So, you know, a lot of the murals, those are the stories of our people. And it's a great place where two countries and two cultures kind of converge and join together and they form this special little place we call La Frontera. Join me as I explore the border and all it has to offer. Celebrating the richness, diversity, and possibilities that can't exist anywhere else. They say the grass is greener on the other side. But what happens when you're right on the fence? I'm Patti Hinich, and this is La Frontera. Patti, how are you? I am good. I am really happy to be here with you today, Ali. Thank you so much for having me. No, no, thank you so, so much. I mean, when, when we worked out all, all the details over the weekend, I just said, you know what, this is the best surprise guest we could have for leading the way. And I just, I, again, I just really want to say thank you. Oh, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. And now we have lots to talk about because I just came back from filming in the Borderlands, which is one of your main themes. It really is. And so, you know, we just watched this, tra this trailer. So, you know, to begin with, um, you know, you spent years describing to the American public, if not the world, uh, Mexican food and culture uh, and the people of Mexico. What led you to decide to say, you know what, let's focus in on the borderlands? Ali, so after so many years of treading between Mexico and the U.S., as you know, I switch careers from being a political analyst and historian. I wanted to be an academic and I worked in a 
policy analysis research center, a think tank for many years. And I switched careers to cooking and I kept, you know, opening a window into Mexico and connecting Mexico to the US, breaking myths and preconceptions about us Mexicans and increasingly Latinos. And after so many years of coming and going, I have been here in the US for 20 years. My three boys were born here, they're Mexican American. There was something that kept pulling me to the border. When you're an immigrant in this country, you're always treading between worlds. You have the, the cultures, the cuisine, the language, everything that you've inherited from your home country. And then unbeknownst to us, you grow roots here too. So I've strengthened my roots to Mexico intensely with the show Patty's Mexican Table and all the cookbooks I've done and my family is there. But at the same time, I've grown really strong roots in the US. And, and so this intense pull of being two things at the same time is felt more intense in no place more than La Frontera. And I kept getting emails and requests from people saying, Patty, come to the border, come to the border. And of course, hearing everything that's happening in the news. And as the years have gone by, I've really felt a responsibility to bring the microphone to places that don't have a microphone and to places that we keep hearing about and people keep on translating and explaining their issues, but the people there have no opportunity to do so. So with Patty's Mexican Table, I did that. I started in Mexico and Mexico City, Puebla, Oaxaca, then went to the north, went to the Baja Peninsula, started trading, you know, around the border. And I felt, okay, it's time. It's time to go to the border. And it was absolutely fascinating. And I felt such joy for being able to just come in and say, here's a microphone, tell us who you are and share your stories. And people were so giving and so generous and so happy to have the opportunity to talk and show who they are without everything being edited to fit a very narrow narrative. And so we were thrilled to be able to showcase the food, the culture, the art, the history, the legends, the traditions, and show how, you know, La Frontera and the borderlands is really a place where these constant clash and rubbing between countries and cultures really opens a new universe of possibilities where you find things that cannot exist anywhere else. And that goes um, for food and art and business as well. Yeah. So many people don't know that there's so much going on between the US and Mexico and mostly Ali that the borderlands isn't a place where you will only find Mexicans trying to come into the U.S. or, sorry, that was my phone, or people don't know about the Americans that are south of the border, but it is a place where you find Syrian, Lebanese, Haitian, Cubans, Japanese, Chinese, I mean, just all sorts yeah. of people. So to break down more, more myths. And I mean, one of the places that I love along the border is El Paso. Um, you know, the, it's, it's such a unique city because, you know, it's, all, it's very remote, right? It's four hours from any other major city. But, you know, I saw the, the murals of El Paso that you profiled, um, the people. So tell me a little bit about kind of visiting El Paso as, you know, a city that, you know, people read about and kind of see, but very few have actually experienced. I know. So El Paso was, was really fascinating. And I have to tell you, Ali, I've gotten so much correspondence from people in El Paso through the years because of my other show, Patty's Mexican Table, and people were just so incredibly warm. And when you go from El Paso to Ciudad Juarez, you feel the stark difference between being in one country and another. You feel it, you hear it, you sense it, you taste it. But at the same time, it's like two sides of the same coin. It is... Yeah. They're so incredibly interconnected in so many ways. And you realize, as my friend Alfredo Corchado was saying, you know, he, he joined us for the first episode, there are blood ties that run along the border. You know, the border moved people and some people didn't even move. The border just moved, you know, north or south of them. And... The food was fascinating, the people were fascinating, but also it's 
really interesting to see how at the border there's such um like so much attention from people trying to hold on to their traditions and who they are you know americans and mexicans so at the same time you you feel you see this pride of people holding on to they are to who they are and where they come from but at the same time there's all these new things happening so for example we met these all female mariachi band which would never happen in mexico city where i come from so it's you know you see the traditions you see the suits you hear the songs but mariachi is has been traditionally male dominated and it is at the border you know where these things can change and um, yeah. and these women are breaking new ground and we went to you know a part in at the border where the cattle are crossing every day um, and it's cattle that is born in Mexico already being Mexican-American. So it was really fascinating. It's Mexican cows uh, that come from American dads that grow up in Mexico, then move to the U.S., then become U.S. prime, and then they're sold on both sides. And there's all these businesses and entrepreneurs benefiting from the the international trade and commerce that is happening every second at the border so so much that's going on at the border that's not only what we hear in the news and that that has to do also with your very first question Ali that I didn't respond which was the murals the art is insane yeah. I mean El Paso and also Ciudad Juarez but I feel like mostly El Segundo Barrio in El Paso which is a neighborhood of mostly Mexican immigrants they have felt the need to tell their stories just like oral stories but painted on walls so the city yeah. has become like a living breathing museum and all the people from el paso and ciudad juarez that come and go haven't found space in the history of the books of any of the country of Me mexico or the us so they're telling their stories so they won't be forgotten and they will be shared with more generations on the walls and they're just spectacular. And then um, there's a difference also along the, the Texas, Mexico, US Mexico border and Texas between El Paso and then the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so different. So different. So describe some of those differences uh, for so us. So different. Oh my gosh. So El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, um, El Paso is much more metropolitan, much more international, even though it's miles from nowhere. Um, and El Paso is so connected to Ciudad Juarez. There's, you know, a thriving art scene, food scene. There's a lot of innovation, a lot of businesses, you know, uh, going back and forth. Then you, you drive down to the Tularedos and it is a mind boggling, Ali. It is like, uh, as Tano Tijerina was telling us, it is like the aorta of um, truck trading um, these days. I mean, it's just millions and millions and millions of dollars going through the trucks, through the Tularedos. And at the same time, you have these communities in Laredo and Nuevo Laredo that really live, Ali, as if they were still living in the Republic of the Rio Grande you know, more than a century ago in how close and united they feel and how they treat each other like family. And they're really holding on to, to traditions and to deep family values and of hard work on both sides of the yeah. border. And I mean, they're really made of a different kind of moral fiber, just good hearted, just solid. So when I was there, I kept thinking, you know, the Tularedos have this international savvy because, you know, there's so much of the economy going through them, but they have like this small town heart. Yes. <laughs> sweet and kind and the food is spectacular. And then you go to the Rio Grande Valley, that is a whole other story. And then we yeah. drove to McAllen. Yeah, so in, McCall in McAllen, you spent some time with Sister Nora Pimentel with Catholic yes. Charities. How was that? It was, it was, it was truly an incredible experience and um, I had the opportunity to talk to her and connect and listen from her you know and hear what drives so much of her compassion and work and her personal story um, and we went to the respite center where there's 
so many people um, just trying to get their bearings and connect with their family and find a path. And um, we went from there to Brownsville to SpaceX, you know, where Elon Musk is trying to launch men to Mars. So all of this is happening at the border. And we went to a nature preserve, uh, sable palm trees that are only there, uh, are not anywhere else in the US. And so you have these jungle, these nature preserves, you have SpaceX, you have these rockets being launched to, you know, to space in this beautiful pristine beach where people from Brownsville and Matamoros are making carne asada tacos. So it is, it is really a place like no other. And it really makes you see how the border and the borderlands are a place that need to get known better and their stories shared more. This is a place that has people that are enriching two countries at the same time against all odds. It's amazing because like you said, you know, in Brownsville, you've got rockets going into the atmosphere, you have migrants seeking protection, but then you have communities living. Um, and, you know, my final question for you is, what do you think, what, what surprised you most about your, your, your trips there? Uh, I mean, every story was a fascinating story. But one of my favorite stories, I think, um, was that of a family of Japanese American cattle ranchers in the Rio Grande Valley. And this is a family that came from Japanese immigrants who were migrant farmers who arrived in the U.S. and, and were farming in California and then they were put in camps after Pearl Harbor. And then once they they um, were allowed to get out, they had nothing to go back to in California. So they continued being migrant farmers in Texas, in the Rio Grande. And they started cattle ranching and they grow Akaushi beef, beef which makes Wagyu beef. So their pride, I mean, the, the meat is some of the most extraordinary you've ever tasted. And it's Wagyu beef, you know, something that the Japanese people and culture are so proud about. And they're um, sharing this beef and they're selling it to chefs to make Tex-Mex fajitas. So you have this Japanese American family um, and, and the, the, the mom um, is married to a man who's Me Mexican heritage, but he's mm -hmm. been in the US for like five generations. So you have this Mexican, Japanese American, they're raising um, Akaushi beef. They're enriching this country with something that makes them really proud about the culture where their home country and their ancestors came from, but they're super Texan. They're wearing the, <laughs> their cowboy hats. They're so beautiful. They have this ranch. They're contributing so much to the Rio Grande Valley and the rest of the country. So yeah. just like that, I mean, all of the stories were amazing stories. Well, I got to say, Patty, thank you so, so much for the time. And I would highly encourage everybody to please, you know, tune into your local PBS station, watch La Frontera, uh, buy one of Patty's cookbooks. And like I said, the triple lime pound cake is worth it, um, as well as, you know, so many other recipes. But Patty, thank you so, so much for joining. Um, it is always a pleasure to see you. And thank you. And most importantly, thank you for bringing the story of Mexico and the border to the world. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you for having me.